Who's moved the chair? Why is the chair miles away? Ow! Ah! Uh, it is! What's this we found? We've got it. It's the uh, new Indomitus box. Um, massive thanks for Games Workshop sending this to us. It's incredible. I say it's incredible. You can probably tell I haven't, there's the plastic still on it. I haven't opened the plastic yet. Um, I've never done an unboxing. I thought we'd probably do an unboxing for this one because it's just such a big and glorious box. I wanted to open it on camera and, and sort of, I guess, kind of react on camera and you guys can see what I think of what's inside this. I'm really excited by it. I'm mostly excited about the Necron stuff, but the Space Marines look really cool as well. It is the brand new box from Games Workshop, available for pre-order today, at the point this video goes live. That's the 6th of July. This is everything you need to start playing 9th edition. Amazing. Let's get it open. Got my trusty knife, and I'm gonna change the camera angle. Okay, here it is, here's the box. I already busted out the knife and took the cellophane off. I didn't want to show that on camera in case I cut myself and we shouldn't be encouraging children to play with blades, obviously. Um, I've not done this before and I'm not used to my face not being on camera, so hopefully it will be a good insight as to what's in the box. It is a heavy box, it is a big box. It's a chunky box, as you can already tell. Um, there's a load of stuff in it. They already say on the back that there's the rule book, which is close to 400 pages. There's 61, 361? No, there's 61 models in the box. 61 models, now, that's a big chunk of plastic. So get ready for amazing music as we lift lid. Box is open as standard nowadays. You get a cool piece of Games Workshop artwork and actually you can stick these things in frames and stuff and put them up in hobby rooms or studios or offices or wherever you want to. And as you can tell straight away when I lift that off, the box is absolutely packed full of stuff. There is so much stuff in here. So much stuff. Like I said, 61 models and a rule book and a booklet for the specific narrative between these two forces, along with the how to build booklet. There's loads in here. So we start off, and obviously one of the things to note about this box set if you're getting into 40k for the first time is it has the rule book and it has two playable factions. If you're not into 40k for the first time, but you play either of these factions, they're all brand new models that aren't available anywhere else either. So as I say, at the point in which this video goes live, it is available for pre-order on the Games Workshop website and is everything you need to start playing 9th edition 40k. So here we have the brand new Primaris bikes, which I wasn't sold on when I saw them on the first live stream, but they've grown on me and actually in the flesh there's some lovely detail to these. So we've got the Necron bikes, Necron bikes, Space Marine bikes, Necron bikes are also cool, but we've got the Space Marine bikes, so these are cool. Uh, I did promise Brom them, he might be disappointed. Next up, there's two sprues of Assault Intercessors. A point to note on these, if you look at them, is they're very similar to Dark Imperium as to how the sprues are laid out. So they are sort of push fit. Games Workshop have stated that you don't need glue to put these together. You can push fit them all together and away you go. You just need to clip them out. So a set of clippers and you will be able to push these all together and off you can go playing 40k, which is pretty impressive. Um, I have noticed so far, if you look at these in the shoulder pads, there is no horrible joins that go halfway down a shoulder pad that split them in half that you then have to fill in and smooth down, so that's quite nice. Um, it looks like the joins are all in relatively sensible places. So these should look really glorious when they're put together. These will make an amazing addition to my Space Wolves. The only thing that upsets me with these, the only thing that's ever upset me with these is the fact that the shoulder pads are fitted as part of the arm. I get it for the easy to build, but it means I can't put wolves shoulder pads on them and that makes me sad, not without heavy amounts of conversion and I don't know if I can be bothered to do that. So there's two sprues of Space Marine Assault Intercessors and they are exactly the same. Um, so they are mirrored, so you get double, the, you get double a certain type basically. Um, not a massive issue obviously these are easy to build push fit stuff the kits are glorious I'm not whinging but it's a point to note that they are you get duplicates essentially you get two of the same sprues each has five marines on so of your 10 you'll have um, two of each it is an issue for some people um, it can be an issue for me I can be that fussy sometimes as we've taken those out we've looked uh, I look in the box and there's some more characters and stuff now so we have uh, what's this this looks like the blade guard captain and the necron overlord the necron overlord looks incredible if you don't know if you're not in the hobby discord if you're not in the DZTV hobby discord or you don't watch DZTV I am so excited about the necron stuff so I apologize now but I'm all about necrons the blade guard captain does look glorious though he is really really not the detail on these is amazing Look at that. Then we have another set of characters. It looks like a Blade Guard Lieutenant, and it looks like the Royal Warden, the Necron who looks like a beefed up 
um, immortal, basically. So that's pretty cool. Next up is what I think is the Score Pack Destroyers. I think is a Score Pack Destroyer. Score Pack, is that how you say it? They're all new. Um, I think these are the Score Pack Destroyers. They look like they have a lot of detail on them at all. They've got all these new hyper, like there's a lot of new hyper phase weaponry. There's a lot of new Necron melee stuff, which really, I'm, I'm a World Eaters player predominantly at the moment. I like melee. Lots of melee undead robots really appeals to me right now. Then there's a new Necron Warrior kit, which, I mean, it needed a refresh. We've been talking about it for a while, how they needed new models. Warsmith Chris was converting all of his. He was chopping the legs and making them straight and bending them and stuff, and I think he probably regrets that now. But there's a whole new kit. You get two weapon options. I'm not entirely sure the exact differences. I think one is the normal Gauss Blaster, and then there's a shorter range one with a better AP, I think. So these are also really cool. And the Scarabs, the Scarabs look so much better than they did before. They looked awful before, now they look really cool. I, I don't know why I'm so excited about the Scarabs, but I am. And there is 20, 20 new warriors in the box. 20 warriors, again, the sprues are the same, but you get 20 warriors, two squads of 10 or one big squad of 20, however you wanna run them. That's amazing, 20 warriors in a starter box. So on here, it looks like we've got the Scorpec Lord and the Kinetic Reanimator, I think. It looks like we've got both of these. This is the big piece from the Reanimator that gives it away. Um, so I'm not sure what sprue the um, Plasmancer is on. I think I may have missed him, but he's obviously in here somewhere. But that's the two big Necron characters. The Scorpec Lord is, I'm, I'm probably building that this afternoon. Like, I'm so excited by that, I can't tell you. I would love to be able to build that on live stream, but I can't because, you know, NDAs and stuff. So this is gonna, I'm hoping to get all this built by the time this video goes live. Maybe even base coats on it. I'm that excited by this stuff. It's, oh, look at it. Look, Necrons, they they were cool anyway, and some of them, but some of them really needed a refresh. Like the Destroyers, I thought were a bit, Ech, and the new one looks amazing. The warriors definitely needed some work, especially when you consider that the immortals look so much better. I'm this. I'm so happy. I'm so happy about these models. And this space marine sprue is cram packed. So you've got the blade guard ancient. You've got the blade guard. You've got the new melter guys. What are they called? Eradicators. Um, they're on here as well. You have what else have you got? There's loads on here. There's chaplains on here as well. Yeah, Brom's not getting his hands on any of this. Sorry, sorry, mate. So we're through the 61 plastic models. I've had a quick look at the sprues. Um, obviously, I can't show you them built right now. But we have another piece of artwork which separates the second half of the box, which is the bit that we're excited about the most, I think. Well, no, maybe I am more excited about the Necron models. Um, we have the new rule book. So this package is the Edge of Silence. This is the narrative and campaign stuff between the Necrons and the Space Marines. And you also have the How to Build book in the back as well to give you instructions on how to build all of your models, which is really, really cool. And then the rule book. And you only get this artwork, artwork in the rule book that's in this box set. So if you wait and buy the rule book separately, you won't get this cool artwork. And obviously, he's, he's probably going to win, right? Makes sense. Take the rule book out, there's another piece of artwork. There is some transfers for Space Marines. I don't think there's anything else in here. I'm just gonna have, oh, bases. You obviously have all your bases for your models as well, so they're on the bottom there. Uh, and they've all got holes in them already, look, so you can, there you go, look at that. So you can just stick them in the holes. You don't, like I said, no glue required to assemble these, just snips. But yeah, you've got your stickers and you've got another piece of artwork. And then we have the Big Daddy, the new rule book. Now, much to a lot of your despair, yes, this is kept slightly blurry on purpose because, you know, the, the rules aren't out yet. <laughs> so I'm going to have a quick flick through these. Um, there's obviously uh, the normal stuff that exists in the 40k rulebooks. You get a bucket load of lore, and I mean a bucket load of lore, including a lot of glorious artwork from places like Warhammer World, etc. Um, and even more narrative, and even more narrative, and even more narrative, and some more narrative, and some more narrative and more narrative, and it keeps going. And we get to how to play Warhammer 40K on page 194. So there's 190 odd pages of narrative stuff. This, this is your background into the 41st millennium and the 41st uh, universe and all the races exist. There is a little bit at the start, which is about how to play and what 40K is and what you sort of need in terms of getting yourself going, etc. building and painting. Nothing massively complicated or specific instructions, but all that otherwise is narrative. I got distracted. I mean, this might not even be the same day that I'm filming this. This book's incredible. I was gonna go through it on camera with like a top-down view, but it was I had to make it blurry because I can't give you all the details of the book because I get told off by his workshop. So that seemed kind of pointless. And then I got deeper and deeper and deeper and I read it and then I got distracted by um, but 
shot, shot, shiny new Necrons. So I might not have finished the video the same day I started. It's okay, because I got this out to us early, so I've got time. I've been going through the book. I've been going through the core rules, and I'm really impressed. Like, I'm really, really impressed by this book. I think it's incredible. I think Games Workshop have done an amazing job. Some little bits and pieces I'm not entirely sure about, but we'll go over that in a minute. It's good. It's really good. So what I thought we'd do for the rest of this video is basically go over the differences for you. So the way the whole rules is laid out is different. So now you get the, the core sort of bulk of text, and you get like a... Can you see guys see that? You get like a... um bullet point section underneath that then so I'm looking at my screen to make sure it's in focus it's not in focus I don't care um, but you get a bullet point section that tells you exactly what that previous paragraph was saying but in simplified form now you kind of can learn the rules from the bullet points the paragraphs add some context give some examples make it a little bit clearer on occasions sometimes they're a bit wordy and they don't necessarily make them clearer but the bullet points then really clear up some of the qualifying factors for that rule to take place and they've done it for everything which I think is really really good even to the point where here it says army and the bullet point army says, collection of models under your command. Just to make sure you know that that's what your army is. Um, maybe that wasn't required. Maybe it was. This is, let's be clear, this is 8th edition. Okay, it's 9th edition, but it's 8th edition. And what I mean by that is the core mechanics and rules are basically the same. They are basically the same. There is some changes and there's some nuances that exist now in 9th that are very different to 8th. But on the whole, the whole way the game works is similar to how it was in 8th. If you've played 8th edition, if you've been playing 8th edition and you've learned 8th edition, this will not be that hard to pick up. I promise you, it's not that bad. I know some uh, some people in the community were hair on fire panic mode about some of the new terrain rules. Honestly, it's not that bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the book, through the core rules, not for all the missions and stuff, and not for all the crusade stuff yet. That's coming. But I'm going to go through the core rules and tell you the differences between 9th and 8th that I found so far. And other people have found others. I had a phone call with Winters yesterday because he's also got a, uh, a copy of this. And we were discussing things that he'd picked up and things that I'd picked up that each of us had missed as well. So there's a lot to take in because I think the last edition was 16 pages of rules or something like that. This is about 38 pages of core rules before you then go into mustering your army and battlefields and stuff like that. So don't be deterred by that. Don't think that makes it massively complex and complicated. What they've done is they've, where they had a sentence before, they've turned it into a big paragraph with bullet points to make it clearer and hopefully reduce the need for FAQs and erratas. So I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to go through some of the basic changes to the rules. Uh, the things I've picked up so far, so you guys can watch this video on day of pre-order and go, I like all these differences, because obviously you haven't got the rules until maybe next week. What I will be doing is a series of videos where I'll break down each phase a little bit further. There'll be maybe five, ten minutes. Hopefully I can have a whole series at the end and you can kind of learn to play the game of 40k without even having the rulebook bust by watching these videos. Uh, or if you've got the rulebook, you can watch the video alongside it and go, okay, that makes sense. I don't know if you're going to need that level of clarification because I do think these are really well written, but maybe that's just me. The first major change, the first major change that exists is your unit coherency. I say major. It's a tweak, and a lot of these are tweaks, but this is different. So first change is unit coherency. Um, basically, if you're one to five models in a unit, it's no different. Within two inches horizontally, five inches vertically of another model from that same unit, that's how it's kind of always been. However, if you're six models or more, that changes, you need to be in range of two models or more from your unit, which is interesting because that will start to reduce the footprint of some bigger units, stop some of the daisy chaining that happens because you need to remain in coherency. And there's a bit more of a focus on coherency later on in the book as well, which we will obviously cover. They've introduced a thing called engagement range, and engagement range is basically close combat range, and engagement range is an inch. So if you're within an inch horizontally of an enemy model, you are within engagement range and therefore tied up in close combat. So kind of the same as before, but they've put a title on it. There is, however, an important change that people are missing. You also are in engagement range if you're within something five inches vertically. So if you are on three inches up in ruins and your Imperial Knight is touching basically just below you and he's within five inches of you vertically, he can now fight you in first level ruins. So can Maul of Fiends, Demon Princes, all these sorts of things where you step up one level in a ruin before and you're perfectly safe from melee, not anymore. If you're six, seven, eight inches higher in the ruin, then you're safe because it's got to be five inches vertically from base to base. But if you're first level, you are not safe anymore. And I really like that change because it means that models on ground floor can reach models on first floor if they're big things like Imperial Knights, like Maul of Fiends, like I say, Demon Princes, etc. A lot of things in this book are clarifications that existed in things like chapter approved FAQs and erratas from the last edition. For example, there's a whole section on within and wholly within and clarifying what means what, because that got clarified before on an errata or in a chapter approved. These things are now in the book. This is what's starting to beef the rules out a little bit more and mean that they're more than the 
previous number of pages from the old rulebook. I'm not against it because hopefully it's going to avoid that need for erratas, like I said before. There's a section on rerolls and a clarification on rerolls, which is quite interesting. If you if you need multiple dice to roll, so charge charge range is is, is a perfect example of this. If you need multiple dice to to, to do a roll, charge is two d six, and you reroll the charge roll, you reroll both 2d6. That's important because of a change to the command point uh, reroll strategy, which we'll talk about later. But you can't you can't roll one of those if you're doing a reroll. You have to roll both. Again, that's a clarification. If you are allowed to reroll something, you have to roll all of the dice that that give you that result. They do add a section in on half strength units and they clarify what those are. That's important for the morale phase um, when you take combat attrition tests. If you haven't seen the community article, I'll cover it briefly. Um, but basically, you need to know that if you're less than half your starting models, you are under half strength. There's more clarification in the rulebook. If you add units to a, or add models to a unit because you can grow for whatever reason, termagants from a termagant and stuff like that, you recalculate the half strength. But yeah, half strength is half the unit size if you didn't get that. The game is now seven phases. Um, so phase two to seven is kind of phases you already knew anyway. So the movement, psychic, shooting, charge, fight, and morale phase. Phase number one is the brand new one, which is the command phase. The command phase says, basically you gain a command point if you're battle forged every command phase, and then you can resolve any rules that occur in the command phase and progress to the movement phase. So basically there are rules that are gonna now exist in either missions or on data sheets that take place within the command phase. So before basically the turn begins, historically we know the movement phase as being the first turn or the first phase of the turn, that's now the command phase. So before you even start moving models, you now have a phase where things can happen rather than that being that gray area where your opponent ends his turn and you start your turn. And that's now gonna be, I think, where we find this as a placeholder. So where it says at the start of your turn, things like that will probably change to in your command phase, I would guess. And it adds some clarification to it and some clarity as to when these things exist. The movement phase is very much exactly the same as it was before. However, they've added a clarification on remaining stationary. If you don't move, your class is remaining stationary. It's as simple as that. I think that's probably going to come into effect with other rules later on. I think if you choose to do actions and missions, because you can do actions like raise banners and stuff, you need to remain stationary to do those actions. So I think that's that. Um, in all of these, like advancing and normal moving, it obviously states you need to maintain unit coherency. The reinforcement section is a lot clearer than it was before. There was a lot of mess in 8th edition, especially early on around reinforcements and how things that come in from teleport or things that come in from um, psychic power or whatever and how they uh, they're treated like a reinforcement or not. This clarifies it. It also gives you criteria as to how it comes on when it comes on etc. It does state that if a unit arrives from reinforcement, no matter what, it counts as moving its full distance. And if it's a flyer or something similar that's got a minimum and maximum distance, it counts as moving its full distance no matter what. That's a clarification that was required in 8. That now tells you that straight away. But otherwise, not really changed. Moving over terrain, ever so slight change to it, or clarification again, I should say. If it's one inch or less, you ignore it when moving over. It's like little walls or hedges or stuff. If they're less than one inch, you can just go straight over, that's fine. More than one inch, you then need to measure the distance and see if you can make it. Um, and then there's flying, essentially units with the fly keywords. A lot of this hasn't changed. It basically says they can move over models and terrain as if they're not there, essentially. But that is for the movement, advance, and um, movement, advance, and full back moves. That's the ones. Not for charge. The change is for charge and it's clarified later on. Big change here as well. Fly units used to be able to as part of the falling back section of the movement phase. It used to say models that fall back cannot shoot unless they have the fly keyword. That's changed. Models cannot shoot if they fall back unless they have the Titanic keyword in 9th edition. There's nothing about flying there and there's nothing in flying about that too. Currently, as it stands in this rulebook as I read it, models with the fly keyword can no longer fall back and just shoot without penalty. Now I'm a Simhan elder player and you think that makes me really sad because everything's jet bikes and skimmers. I think it kind of makes sense. It was a bit powerful to be able to, with my army, fall out everything out of combat if someone had worked hard to tie, to tie me up and be able to shoot my whole army. So. I'm kind of on board with that. There's two pages on transports, and on the whole, they're not that different. There is a section on destroyed transports, and if you're in a transport that is destroyed, you cannot then charge once you've dis emergency disembarked. That was able to be done at the start of 8th edition. It got FAQ'd later in the in the edition. It's now in the core rulebook, so I'm not sure that's a change we're surprised about because it got FAQ'd anyway, so it's not really a change. It's just in the core rulebook. Then there's two pages on aircraft, and they talk about aircraft engagement range. Again, 8th edition, aircraft were a bit of a pain to place, and people could use model placement to block aircraft and stuff like that, which didn't sort of make sense, because they're supposed to be way up there, and your little Gretchen can stop it from moving. There's a whole page on aircraft engagement range and how it can move through model bases and stuff like that without any penalty whatsoever, etc. Again, it's not a massive surprise. It's just a clarification. There's a thing about heroic intervention. Basically, you do not have to pile in towards an enemy aircraft if you heroically intervene, or 
or pile in or consolidate unless you have the fly keyword then you do basically if your character cannot hit that flyer because he doesn't have the fly keyword they're not forcing you to then go towards him or consolidate into him kind of makes sense right there's a change to the psychic phase we're in psychic phase now there's a change to this which is interesting um i spoke to winters about this and mikey from hellstorm now he didn't think it mikey didn't think it was a problem because he did it this way anyway but i've always done it the other way um I'll clarify. In 8th edition, there was a point where I could pick my Farseer and I could cast a Psychic Power and see what happened. And if I was happy with that, maybe I'd go to my Warlock and I'd cast a different Psychic Power. And if that went off and I was okay with that, I could jump to the Hemlock. Then I could come back to the original Farseer and cast a second power because he could cast three or two. And I could go back to the another Warlock and I would jump between Psychos and do things in order, in sequence, to basically maximise my potential, maybe my damage output or my combinations. And it might change. I might do a Farseer power and go, I'm happy with that. That's meant that I do this with a Warlock. So when I do this, like, oh, actually, that's been successful. So now I might do a different one with the Farseer. That's now changed. The wording specifically is, once you have selected an eligible Psyche unit from your army, you can attempt to manifest one or more Psychic Powers with it. After you have finished manifesting all of this unit's Psychic Powers that you want to, you can then select another eligible Psyche unit from your army and attempt to manifest Psychic Powers with and so on. Basically now, there is no jumping between Psychos. So poor Thousand Suns players who might do the same as what I did with my Eldar so that you sequence it in a specific order to maximise your damage output. That's gone. Pick a Psyker, do all the Psychic Powers move on to the next one i think that's kind of how it was in in sixth and seventh edition i'm pretty sure that's how it was that's now how it is in ninth edition it hurts the psychic armies ever so slightly if that player was pretty competent with his psychic phase honestly for me it's not that big a deal i think it's kind of it makes sense the shooting phase is very similar to what it was before that's not particularly different at this stage there is another section i'm going to go on to in a couple of pages time which will make some changes to the shooting phase essentially it's the same um, the only real thing that's been massively clarified is you shoot with all weapons of the same type from that unit at the same time before you move on to the next type so you can't fire two storm bolters and then a last cannon and two storm bolters. i think that was kind of the case anyway but that's definitely been more clarified in this edition there's now two pages of ranged weapon types, very little in the way of changes. There's assault, grenade, pistol, rapid fire, and heavy. Heavy main change is that only infantry suffer the minus one to hit for moving and firing heavy weapons, which I think is welcome for all of us. It always didn't seem to make sense to me for a dreadnought or a tank to move and suffer a penalty. It's literally a mobile gun platform. What? It didn't make sense. That's now changed, and I'm I'm really happy about that. Then there's the big guns never tire rule that you guys may have seen on the community page. Basically, if you're a vehicle or monster, already now you don't suffer the penalty for moving foreign heavy weapons because of the heavy weapon change. But also now you can fire into combat with your weapons on your tanks or on your monster if they're tied up. So it's going to be almost... Not impossible, but it's hard now for an opponent to tag a tank and keep it tied up. Interestingly, you can fire out of combat, but only if the stuff you're in combat with is destroyed, well, in engagement range with, is destroyed first. So you can choose to fire your three heavy bolters from your Lehman Russ into the um, into the Hormigant surrounding your tank, and then you might choose to fire your battle cannon down range at another unit, say a Carnifix or something. As long as you fire those heavy bolts first and you kill those Hormigants, you can then fire your battle cannon. If you fail to kill those Hormigants, your battle cannon's wasted. So you can split fire with your tanks or your monsters, but you need to kill what your engagement range with first before you can fire out. If you do fire heavy weapons in combat, that's minus one to hit, obviously. That's about the only time monsters and vehicles now suffer a minus one is when they're firing at stuff that they are in combat or in engagement range with. There's a change to Lookout Sir. Lookout Sir is character rules, basically. Um, basically, if a character was on the battlefield previously and anything else was close to the enemy, you, you basically couldn't target the character. That's now changed. That character needs to be within three inches of a vehicle, a monster, or a unit with three or more models. And that character also needs to not be closest and visible to the enemy. So if he doesn't fulfill any of those criteria, he can then be targeted. Um, which is good because no longer do you have a character in the middle, in the open, on his own. And then a set of units over here, like... 12, 15, 18 inches away and you can't target him because then that's gone. He needs to be within three inches of those. It sort of makes sense. If he stood out in the middle of the battlefield on his own, he stood out in the middle of the battlefield on his own. So you should be able to target him. Now you can. And there's a new rule type, a new weapon type, blast weapons. Blast weapons are in this, and there's two pages of blast weapons or a page of blast weapons at the back of the book that tells us all the current weapons in the game and what are now classified as blast. Um, blast weapons are a Lehman Rust Battle Cannon is a prime example. D6 shots for a Lehman Rust Battle Cannon, I think it is. I think it's always been D6. Yeah, it's two D6, D6 shots. And it was always random. You could fire at a unit of 30 Plague Bearers and, and get one hit. And that was very depressing. Not the case anymore. Basically now, if they are between, I think it's six and ten models, you get minimum three. You can get higher if you roll higher. Roll higher. 11 or more models, minimum six. Maximum 
maximum hits, basically. That means that Mylene and Russ Battle Cannon were grinding in advance, now fires at 30 Plague Bearers. I'm guaranteed 12 shots. Amazing. That's amazing. I'm really happy with that. The last weapons, however, cannot be fired in engagement range. So although your tanks and vehicles can fire at units they're in engagement range with, it doesn't count for blast, we uh, for blast weapons. There's a section on making attacks that covers both the shooting and the melee phase, uh, the fight phase, to hits, to wounds, allocated saving throws and inflict damage. Basically, the process is exactly the same for engagement range, melee, and for shooting phase. So they've compacted it into one place and said that you apply these rules to both and it gives you the to wound rolls which are no different it gives you what you need to do how you hit how you allocate all that kind of stuff again most of this isn't different i was hoping they would change that melee attacks damage spilled over i really wanted that change for a, for a melee focused army they haven't done that that's fine i thought they might bring it in because it's an aos thing but they haven't anyway it's basically the exact same there's basically no difference at all the difference being modifiers now, this is huge so it used to be that a six always wounded a one always failed and a one to hit always failed that's changed ever so slightly same uh, as before apart from sixes to hit now always hit no matter what so if you roll a six to hit you hit i'm not entirely sure that rule was needed mm, i'll explain because they've changed modifiers. So it used to be you'd face an Alatoc Eldar army and they would have a Crimson Hunter Exarch who's minus one because he's a flyer. And then it's minus one again because he's a Latox who's minus two. And then they would use lightning fast reactions to make him minus three. And it got silly, right? It got really silly. So minus three to hit on a flyer. Hmm. Okay, and then you've got your, before Orcs had Daka 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 or other armies that hit on five pluses, well I now can't hit you at all. So six is to hit, always hit. But they've changed stacking modifiers. No matter what the end result is, I have plus two, you've got minus eight, and it ends up at minus six to hit. Doesn't matter. No matter what the end result is, you can't get better than minus or plus one. That Alatoc flyer at minus three to hit, and I've got my heavy weapon infantry last gun that I move that then becomes minus four to hit. Nope, minus one. Full stop, no matter what. And a lot of people are saying, well, that makes things like the Vindicare's ability to be minus two and cover pointless, but it doesn't. Because if you think about it, if he's targeted by a unit that has plus one to hit, he still gets minus one because he's minus two. If he had only minus one in cover, he wouldn't get any save, uh, any uh, minus at all. So it doesn't completely nerf it, it does make it worse. But one of the things I hated the most hated the most in 8th edition was a stackable negatives to hit so i'm i'm totally on board with this it also applies to wound rolls as well though you can't get better than minus one or plus one to wound which means no longer can you stack abilities like uh, vets of the long war etc to get plus three to wound which means you trigger x on four pluses or two pluses or three pluses when they should only be triggering on six pluses same as death to the false emperor there was ways you could stack death to the false emperor and it'd be triggered on four pluses that's gone now the best you can trigger that on is five plus because the best you can get is plus one to hit and again, although it hurts my world eaters on certain occasions, I'm all for it because it's it's not broken. It makes sense. I think that's a great change. I think that's going to make a lot of occasions that were not quite so fun before a lot more fun for people. Invulnerable save, saving throws, mortal wounds. They're all basically exactly the same. Mortal wounds still spill over. Ignoring wounds. There's a clarification there that again existed in FAQ. If you've got feel no pain and disgustingly resilient, you can't use both. You can't use Disgusting Resilient, fail, and then roll your Fiona Pain save. One or the other, you pick one now. Big change to charges that's been announced on the community page and is all in the rule, is, is again in the rule book. If you decide you want to declare charges on multiple units, you need to be able to reach multiple units. This is important when also considering the new rules on unit coherency. So no longer can you charge a unit nine, 10 inches in front of you and go, well, actually, there's one to my left that's four inches away. So for a safety net, I'm going to declare both. And I rolled three and a half. Oh, you can't roll three and a half. I rolled three inches, so I can move within an inch of that unit that's just under four inches away, and I, I can ignore that one that's nine inches away because I just, it was a gamble. If I got there, brilliant. If I haven't, I've got my safety net. Gone. Can't do that. You need to be able to make both. If you do that, if you declare both, you need to roll not only a charge range that is long enough that you can tag both units, you need to not be within engagement range of any other unit, and you need to maintain unit coherency. If you're doing that charge range and you've got to maintain coherency, you're going to have to have more than five models, which means your coherency requires every model to be in range with two other models. You can see how this is starting to make things like that a lot more complex and complicated. And it's, it's a lot of these clarification. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it, people. Don't hate me, YouTube. Don't hate me. Because I did some of this stuff. A lot of these clarifications basically stop gamey moments that shouldn't exist on a narrative battlefield. And that's why I love them. Because you don't get a string of guard infantry tagging four tanks, all just in coherency and being brave enough to stand there. And the tank can't run it over or blow it away. And the guardsman tags it. And it doesn't matter that you only declared... You declared or it, 
I love this. I love it. Heroic interventions are basically the same. There's no real changes there, but um, must be an enemy unit within three inches horizontal and five inches vertical. A character can perform heroic, heroic interventions. That's the vertical has been added in again. There's a lot of this five inch vertical stuff that snuck in uh, to ninth edition to basically allow the multi-level play that we saw in eighth quite a lot, but didn't really have rules for it. Then it goes on to charging over terrain and flying when charging and stuff like that. So charging over terrain, if it's one inch or less, you ignore it, much like the movement phase. If it's higher, you need to measure it and make sure you can make that distance. And if you can't, the charge fails. Flying when charging, fly models can move over other models when they make a charge move. Fly models move over terrain, including builds like any other model when they make a charge move. However, um, the, that that's... I had to stop and reread. So basically what it means is you move like other models over buildings. So you have to measure the distance when you're flying over buildings. You can move over other models fine, but buildings and terrain you need to measure. That's to stop that zero inch charge stuff that happened in eighth, which is fine. Big change to Overwatch. You've probably seen it. You've probably seen a lot of it about on the internet already. Overwatch is basically gone for everybody, unless you have a specific ability that gives it to you, or you pay a command point for Overwatch. That's amazing. So it happens the same way as it happened before. It's still sixes to hit. It still happens before charge roll is made. All charge targets that can fire Overwatch do so, but you don't get it stand anymore. <laughs> Let's see towel. Overwatch is basically gone for most other armies, um, unless you're paying command points. And I, again, as a melee-focused army, I really like this change. Too many times playing with things like World Eaters, would I? I played a guy at no retreat, um, absolute legend of an opponent and a great opponent, and we had a good game, don't get me wrong, but you have no idea how depressing it is when you're playing against Tau Sept. So you, you take a shooting phase, you then take another shooting phase just as you're going to get into charge range, and then when you finally charge, you then take an Overwatch at five. It was It's demoralising. And it's not changed because Tau get Overwatch anyway. But at least it doesn't happen against every army now, right? So, I mean, that's a bonus. There's a subtle change to the fight phase I know a lot of people have missed. Um, it used to be the case that the player whose turn it was picked a unit to fight with first after charging models have fought. That's now changed. It's now the, players who's, the player whose turn it isn't picks I'll read it, it makes more sense. Starting with the player whose turn is not taking place, the players must alternate selecting an eligible unit from their army and fighting with it. That's after charging units. Charging units still fight first. So if I have two units engaged in combat and I charge two units in, we resolve those two units that charge first because they've charged, then my opponent picks. What's interesting is if it's my turn and I haven't made any charges but I've got four units engaged in combat, my opponent goes first. And I think maybe that's to add some semblance of balance for getting nuked quite hard in turns as well. So I have a full shooting phase, I then move into my fight phase, and then I have all my I have the first go at fighting something. It gives my opponent a chance to have a little stab back in my turn and just not get obliterated. I guess I'm kind of like it's a weird chain. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure why that's changed but it's got to be there for a reason. I think it's to add a degree of balance in turns to stop getting people just hammered for a whole turn. It gives them a little something, little, little something. The other difference in the fight phase is who can fight. So in the old edition, you could either pick models that were within an inch of enemy models or models that were within an inch of models from the same unit within an inch of enemy models. Now, the first part of that hasn't changed. Engagement range is an inch. So if your model is within an inch of an enemy model, he is in engagement range and he can be he is eligible to fight. The difference is the second part. Friendly models from the same unit need to be within half an inch of a model within half an inch. So that's basically going to, I think, completely get rid of three ranks fighting. You can't, it's going to be almost impossible to do that now because you basically have to be a lot closer in and more compact. And it also allows less opportunity for you to spread out and tag, and tag multiple units of multiple models. So now you have to be within half an inch of a model within half an inch of an enemy to be eligible to fight. Again, I think that's a good change. So although we're looking at some of these rules that have happened in, eight, in ninth edition and thinking it's more of a melee focused addition. I don't think that's entirely true. I think it's more balanced to it. I think that, for example, is a bit of a nerf because you can get less models in range. The changes to the charge phase and having to having to make the charges to multiple units, I love the change. I think it's narrative. Again, it is a bit of a nerf because you don't have that safety net. Piling and consolidation is, is covered in this phase and it makes sure you stay within coherency. And I'm coming to it. I'm coming to why. And now we're there. Now we're at why. So we've got the morale phase. The morale phase has had an, an overhaul, a basically a complete overhaul. So in the old edition, if you if you knew, if you're new to ninth or you need to 40k, in the old edition, you lost five models and your leadership was seven. You rolled a d6 and added those lost models to the result. So you rolled five and you'd lost five. Your result is 10. Your leadership is seven. You take seven away from 10. You lost three models from your unit, full stop. There was occasions when you could automatically fail. If, you, if a, a unit of 30 Orc boys' as leadership is six, and you killed seven of them, any dice roll, roll was going to result in lost models. You were going to fail because you couldn't, it was impossible to get below your leadership at that point when you add your casualties onto your final dice roll. Now, in ninth edition, that's changed. A one is a pass. 
no matter what. It's like heroic, insane bravery. A one passes. That's fine. And if you fail, if you do roll a dice and you add your casualties and you're over your highest leadership, you are failed. You failed your morale. You failed your leadership. You lose one model at that point. Instead of the number of different, you just lose one. That's it. Really simple, really easy to work out. You lose one model. Then you take combat attrition tests for every model less left in the unit. Basically, it's a D6 for every model in the unit. It's like a wrecked vehicle. You roll a one, they flee. That's simple as that. The difference being if the unit is under half strength. And at the moment, this is the only time where I've seen the half strength thing come in. If they're under half strength, then it's they flee on a one or a two. So if you if you had 30 and your unit's 14 people and you fail your leadership, ones and twos they flee because they're, they're less brave because there's less of them. They know they've been battered by the the throes of battle already and they're more likely to run away. After the morale or that part of the morale phase, you then move into the unit coherency checks. And unit coherency check, basically, you check your incoherency. And if you're not in coherency, you start removing models. You just take them off the board until you're in coherency. In the old days, unit placement and how you would remove models was very tactical for some people. And they would remove a model here because it meant that model stays tagged on that tank. And they'd remove this model here because it meant my last cannon's free to ca and, and blah, blah, blah. And they would just remove models and they would just decimate unit coherency for the sake of keeping sergeants, keeping last cannons, keeping special weapons, keeping things tagged, keeping things tied up gone. Because if you do that, you now have to start removing models until you're back in full unit coherency at the end of this phase. So you don't have that situation now at the end of a, of, end of a turn where units are out of coherency, because if they are, you start removing models. Love that. I'm all, I love that. I'm all about that. Some slight changes to objective markers for battles, and you'll see this on battle reports. You have a 40 mil objective, which I think is roughly the size of the deploymentzone.tv objective markers that are available on the merchandise page on the website link below just saying and then you have to be within three inches of the edge of that marker so rather than trying to work out the center of your cool objective marker which was a pain in the backside you now just have to be within three inches of the objective marker a positive change because it's easy to work out it's quicker and it sucks if you've got giant hellstorm mouse mat ones just saying so I've actually I've already given my kibbies for that and he's proved to me that they're fine which made me sad because I didn't want them to be fine. Missions are changed ever so slightly. There's now multiple steps to a mission. Muster army, mission briefing, create the battlefield, deploy forces, determine first turn, resolve pre-battle rules, begin the battle, end the battle, determine victor. One thing I have noticed in all of the missions so far in the 9th edition rulebook is they end at the end of battle round 5. It. Variable game length is gone. End of battle round 5 ends. They have the criteria for who wins and who loses and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to dig too deeply into this right now, but it's pretty much everything you expected from 8th, but clarified a bit deeper again, like I say. They talk about reinforcements, for example, and reinforcement points, and how that if you're playing match play, you need to make sure you have the reinforcement points to bring those things on and stuff like that. They talk about understrength units, unit champions. It's nothing major there. It's pretty standard stuff that you guys, if you've played 8th, will already understand. Now, one of my favourite changes to 9th battle forged armies and how they work. Again, something that's been all over the community page, but I'm excited by this. So depending on the size of your army in terms of points of power level, depends on how many command points you get. We tend to play 1750 2000, which means we will always start with 12 command points as standard. I love that, that's perfect. It then talks about refunding command points. And again, a, new, a thing that changed in the eighth edition rules, a FAQ that existed, you cannot regain more than one command point per battle round. That's now in the core rules, that's done, tough, that's it. You cannot get uh, refund or gain any command points from pre-game stratagems or anything like that. It says that in there, so that's fine. It talks about factions and army factions, which obviously is important for battle forging armies to so make sure you share keywords. Then detachments. Again, for our size of battle, we tend to use a game that's going to require or allow us to take up to three detachments, but it scales. It makes sense. Less than 500 points is one, up to 3,000 points is four, and it scales in between. Now, when you select a detachment, you pay command points for it. So you start with 12. In 8th edition, you started with none. Now you start with 12. In 8th edition, you took a battalion, you gained 5. You took another spearhead, you gained another 1 for 6. You were then battle force, you had 9 command points. Basically, the most common number we saw was 9 command points. This is different. You now start with 12. And each of the detachments cost points. They cost command points. A patrol is 2, a battalion is 3, a brigade is is four. They have command benefits. Now, what's interesting with these is I wonder if some of these are going to, if some codexes or future publications are going to release new detachments you can use, I don't know, but they get command uh, command benefits. For example, if your warlord is in a battalion detachment, you get plus three command points, but a battalion costs three command points, I hear you say. Well, exactly. Basically, if you use patrol battalion or brigades and your warlord is in one of those detachments, you gain those back and you have that one detachment for free. 
that one detachment is free. And it's to encourage people to continue to include these detachments in their army and have troops on the battlefield. Now, what's important for this, uh, or what's what I think people are missing for this is now the importance of patrol detachments. So a lot of people have said, well, you're just going to continue to see battalions because people will still get 12 command points. It's the same with patrols, though. Patrols, you still get 12 command points. Armies like My Saim Han, where I want to be running vanguards and spearheads and outriders and stuff like that, there's a bonus to a patrol detachment here as well, if you think about it, because I can put one troop's choice and one HQ in that patrol detachment and I still have 12 command points. It still opens up fast attack slots, still opens up uh, heavy support slots, still opens up flyer slots, still opens up elite slots. That's important. So I think we might see a lot more patrol detachments out there as well, where armies are adding in one HQ and one troops to keep their command points high because their H their, the warlord will be in that detachment, so it's a free added bonus. And I'll explain. Um, I was looking at this yesterday. Vanguard, Spearhead, Outrider detachments are all exactly the same in terms of what you can take, but they cost three command points and there's no way of refunding them at all. So if I take my normal uh, Outrider detachment that I take for Syme Harm um, and put my HQ Warlord in there, it costs me three. I start with nine, which is negative. I do get six fast attack sl sl uh, slots, which I love. I only get two heavy and I like to run Fire Prisms, Wave Serpents, etc. So that's a bit sucky because then I might have to add a Spearhead, which is another three, which takes me down to, to six command points which is, I, was, I had five and eight, that doesn't make it better. Now I can put my warlord in a patrol detachment, take one unit of rangers, or maybe some guardians in a, in a wave serpent or something. I get my outrider, I'm still down to nine, granted, but I've got my six fast attack choices, my two heavy from my uh, outrider, I then gain two heavy from my patrol as well. So instead of it costing me six command points, it's only gonna cost me three to field the same army, so I'll start with nine. And obviously in the command phase, I gain one command point every turn. So I'm gonna have a lot more to play with, even if I don't start chucking battalions and brigades down with my Eldar, that's amazing. Other changes, some of my favourite changes, I'm looking at the clock because time's running out, I've crammed this memory card. Uh, Supreme Command is totally different, you used to, be able to take three HQs and up to one Lord of War, gone, gone. Lord of War or HQ choice, that's it, that's what you can take, cost nothing at all. However, there is a command benefit. Restrictions. You can only include one Supreme Command detachment in your army. This detachment can only include one Primarch, Demon Primarch, or Supreme Commander unit, and this unit must be selected as your Warlord. Must be. Take a Supreme Command detachment, you get one HQ or one Lord of War, and it has to be your Warlord. Command benefits. Select one of the following. Plus four command points if your army includes Brigade, plus three if it includes battalion plus two if it includes patrol so although they're penalizing you to a point for taking your warlord out of your battalion detachment which then costs you three command points the command benefit allows you to give that back so there's no real command point penalization now for taking this supreme command detachment it does mean if you take mortarian who is the primarch of the death guard he's your warlord because he's the primarch that's how it works if you take magnus who's the primarch of the thousand sons he's your warlord not araman not your little sorcerer who's hiding at the back of his environment. Magnus. Magnus is the Primarch. He's in charge. But you can refund your battalion. So that's I that's perfect. And also stops the ability of spamming three HQs, three HQs, Farseers, all that. I, yeah, get rid of that. Cool. Super heavy detachments. This is interesting. Cost three CP if nothing has the Titanic keyword. Armages, for example. Cost six CP if they've got the Titanic keyword. No command benefits. What they're stopping here, obviously, is people battering up. Because now, you, you can't take your, your guard brigade and gain more. You can't do that. That's gone because of the way this is structured. This is brilliant! This is, br this is such a good fix to soup and all that nonsense games workshop. What? I never came up with this. This is amazing. Super heavy auxiliary detachments cost 3 CP. You get one Lord of War. That's where you can chuck in things like a Bane Blade or whatever. It does cost you 3 CP though. Again, take your Guard Brigade. That's fine. You start with 12 command points to 2,000 points. Chuck your Bane Blade in there. You lose 3. Tough. Tough. No longer do you have 18 command points, along with orders that are free as well anyway. No. 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 Then there's fortifications, which cost us a command point, and if they're the same faction as your warlord, you gain that command point back, so they're basically free if you want to add them. And auxiliaries cost two CPs. Attachment can include one unit of anything, so you can take an auxiliary heavy support if you want to. Costs two command points to do that, though. Okay, stratagem. Oh, there's so much in this book. I'm going to have to swap memory cards soon. Stratagems. Right. 
There is there used to be three stratagems: command rerolls, uh, counter offensive, and insane bravery. That's changed. There's now seven. Command reroll specifies what you can reroll. You can't reroll anything anymore. That's gone. And for the positive as well, you can use this stratagem after you've made a hit roll, a wound roll, a damage roll, a saving throw, an advance roll, a charge roll, a psychic test as an either witch test, or you have rolled the dice to determine the number of attacks made by a weapon. Get out of a destroyed transport, and your model gets your model gets killed. You've got one. Say you've got one unit in a rhino. You've got your captain in a rhino, and the rhino blows up, and you roll a one. Can't reroll that. Can't, it doesn't say you can reroll that with a command reroll. That's gone. Stop it. Like, you can't do that. It's blown up. He's dead. Tough. Shouldn't leave him in there on his own. It says also a charge roll. And as we learned earlier from rerolls, a charge roll is both dice. So now you roll a six and a one. You can't just pick that one up and reroll that. That's gone. You roll both. You have to reroll both. So that it, it doesn't. You can't go. I'm going to keep the six for a safety net and roll this dice. And I got a three. Yeah, I'm in. Nope. Nope. Stop that. You roll both. I think that's real positive. I hated command point rerolls. I like this little fix. I'm happy with that. Cut them down, they've covered in the community article. Basically, if someone disengages from combat with you, you can roll a number of dice for people that were in engagement range. On a six, they suffer a mortal wound. Perfect, happy days. Desperate breakout is two command points. Essentially, you're ring fenced in by something, plague bearers. You can fall back through them with this command point, with this stratagem. There is some de there's some downsides to it. You can suffer mortal wounds yourself. If you end up in engagement range, you die it still means you can break a unit out. I Sometimes it'll be worth paying these two CPs knowing you can't get the unit out and you destroy the unit, but you can then fire at them with the rest of your army. So that could be really important tactical decision to make. Emergency disembarkation costs a command point. It allows you to disembark from a blown up worker within six inches instead of three. So it stops people from blocking you from disembarking quite so easily, which is great. However, you die on a one or a two when you get out rather than a one. That's cool, one command point. Overwatch is overwatch because our armies don't units don't get it standard now one command point counter offensive interrupting combat two command points hasn't changed insane bravery two command points to automatically pass morale big change you can only use this stratagem once per battle 20 necron warriors one left auto pass morale get loads back next turn get decimated one left auto pass morale get nope once only do that once now much better. And then we move on to strategic reserves. Strategic reserves, long and short of it, there's two pages of, you can now put anything in reserve, absolutely anything. Uh, depending on the power level that you put in reserve, depends on how many command points it costs you, so it's not free, to put things in reserve. From turn two onwards, they can start arriving, and they can arrive from your battle edge or the sides of the boards, as long as they're not in the enemy deployment zone not within nine inches of an enemy and not the enemy battle edge. From turn three onwards, those restrictions lift a little bit. You can now be within the enemy deployment zone. And if you have an enemy unit within one inch of your battle edge, you can even come in in engagement range and it, you count as charging. They have to be within an inch of your battle edge though for you to do that. This allows you to put your really expensive stuff, Mortara, you might take Mortara in your Demon Primark and you might go, you know what, I'm going to put him in strategic reserve and bring him on turn two because I'm not happy sticking him out there in turn one. And because he comes on in your movement phase, you then have, you, you can control what happens. You can maybe take out the unit that's targeting him in the first, or would be the target targeting him in the first place. It gives you a degree of protection of some of your more, more expensive stuff. Really positive, I love that. You can bring them on on any turn. The only change, the, the only way this changes is when you hit match play, and match play rules state only turn two and three. After turn three, you can't bring reserves on the count as lost. Match play is also the one that brings in the restriction for things like terminators, and so that terminators can still only come on from turn two onwards. If you're not using those match play restrictions, terminators can come on from turn one, strategic reserves can't okay perfect also terminators wouldn't cost command points because they have it natively then there's aircrafts and strategic reserve if you're using the strategic reserve rules and i'm going to probably guess that almost 99 percent of the time people will be using strategic reserves you can't block movement anymore there used to be a scenario where you could block an aircraft's movement minimum and maximum and they wouldn't be able to go anywhere and they would just count as destroyed gone in strategic reserves they then Instead of being destroyed, they go into strategic, they take off, basically, they go into strategic reserves. Next turn, you could bring them on, and reserves happens at the end of the movement phase, as usual. And when you bring them on, you can place them anywhere on the board. They have no restrictions. They have to be uh, more than nine inches from enemy models, um, and wholly within six inches of a particular, no, hang on, oh, hang on. You can choose to set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches from any enemy models facing any direction instead of setting it up wholly within six inches. There you go. So instead of six inches, you can put it anywhere you want, your aircraft comes back. If you fly at a point where you fly off the battlefield edge in eighth edition, your aircraft was destroyed. If you're using strategic reserves, not the case. It goes into strategic reserves, it can come on next turn. Downside is you lose a shooting phase, but you don't lose your plane, you don't lose your aircraft. That's really good. Then it talks about actions where you can raise banners and do psychic actions and stuff. I'm not going to go into that now. We'll cover that in a different video. Um, there goes into the terrain stuff, which we've sort of talked about already. There's some terrain traits. I was dreading that. It's not that bad, honestly. It's okay. I don't think it's that bad at all. And then we went into, I, I sort of skimmed through some of the mission stuff. I'm not going to cover this in depth now. 
because I've cut this videos long, right, already. Match play, they've brought in uh, sort of ITC sort of secondary objectives. Again, we'll cover this properly in a different video where we cover match play specifically. Really positive stuff on the whole. I, the missions look good. What I haven't read yet, because I've read the whole book yesterday apart from this stuff, is Crusades and stuff like that. So I'm yet to go through all the missions. But I want to give you guys an overview on day of release of the core rulebook. This is important because this is the 20... Wait, well, I'm caller. This is the 27th of June. Um, I start work on the 29th again for four day, for two days, two nights. Then I've got three days of birthday celebrations for my youngest because we can't have everyone here at once because COVID is a thing. So I'm going to be running out of time to make videos and I want to get this one up on day of release for you and give you all the changes to the core rules that I've noticed and the things I've seen and the things I like. Having read the whole book, I think it's excellent. I, again, I haven't read all the missions and I haven't read the Crusade stuff, but having read the core rules, I think this is an incredible change from Games Workshop. I think it's really, really positive and I was so excited I started building Necrons really quickly. These are glorious models. The rules in the Necrons and Space Marines book we'll cover in a different video as well, I think, maybe. They're really positive too. There's some changes. Warriors get to reanimate, uh, reroll. They get to reroll results of a one when they reanimate. Storm Shields have changed. They're four up vulnerables now but they do give you plus one to your armor save. Interesting change. Little nuances like that, I'm gonna try and cover them in a different video as well if I can get them built, I don't know, no promises. I've got not a lot of time to make a lot of content now. So these videos might come out after the pre-order date, but they're coming. So, so please be patient, they are coming. It's just there's a lot to cover here. This is amazing. I, this is incredible as a book. Uh, if you haven't ordered the book or ordered the box, I should say already, order it. The models are incredible. You won't struggle to sell them if you don't want one half of them. The book is amazing. The rules are insanely good. Good job, Games Workshop, I think, so far. We get to play test it, obviously, but it's been play tested. I was dreading this. A lot of negative press about it. After reading it, I'm really excited about 9th edition, and I can't wait to start playing. I can't wait to start sharing my experiences with you, and I can't wait to keep covering 40k content. <sighs> Good. We're happy. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have enjoyed it, make sure you smash that subscribe button, because a lot of people that watch these videos aren't subscribed. Hit like as well, and... Give me comments below as to what you think is the most significant change I've covered so far. It's really important that you let me know. Don't forget to come and join us in the deployment zone. And you can also join the channel by hitting the little join button. And there's Discord servers for both and all kinds of stuff. So come and join us. Come and chat to us about 9th edition. Get yourselves involved. Thank you very, very much for watching. Oh, don't forget to order it through Element Games, our sponsors. There'll be a link below for that as well. Thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you in the next one.